did you see it coming? No, there was like, you know, there was always arguments with, if it wasn't me one day, it'd be somebody else. If anyone goes, it's over. Do you know what I mean? It will never be the same. I really do believe that. It, it hasn't been the same in certain respects. Alan White, fantastic, brilliant drummer. Did they need to change? I don't think so. I, I really do believe that I would have been able to record a, you know, something comparable at least. Really? Probably a bit tougher. I'm Brian Cannon. This is Microdot. Welcome back. In today's video, I'm joined by Oasis founder member Tony McCarroll. I first met Tony in 1993 when I first started doing the artwork for Oasis. So I've known Tony nearly 30 years. And today's video then is going to be not so much a formal interview, but an informal chat between two old mates in which Tony tells us about his life before, during and after Oasis. Link in the description below to the Microdot website featuring a new print released today which is a picture of Liam Gallagher taken by Tony McCarroll when they were recording, definitely maybe for the first time. So without further ado, me having a chat with Tony. Musically, where did it all begin? With the drums, probably at two years of age. Um, kind of had this natural kind of addiction to the sound of drums. And it started in my mum's kitchen, if you like. You know, bouncing about with a pot. I used to surround myself with pots and pans, yeah. wooden spoons, and I'd be rolling about. Uh, in this, at the same time, then would be you know I'd be trying to do certain uh, marching drum rolls, if you like, you know what what I'd hear from the Salvation Army on the street. Yeah. I was never taught anything, just by ear. Uh, as for God, who did it? I mean, like I said, there was a wide, wide eclectic kind of uh, from the Beatles to bloody oh God, American country, Irish country. There was so much wide range in our house yeah. of music, record player um, and I was just addicted to certain things and would then try to jump on a kit if I could get to a kit uh, probably me, before I was, no, got my first proper kit around six or seven years of age. Did you? You had a kit as early as that? Yeah. Oh wow, Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, bought it off my uh, friend's brother for 50 quid. Did you? Um, what happened to that? I f well, uh, wear and tear with drums, you know, they start pitting, if you like, pitting, and eventually they eventually come, become a hole. Right. You lose the complete sound out of that then. But, uh, you know, I didn't know any different at that age. So I used to go and get white tape, tape it all up, and paint it. So when did you first start playing in public? In public, I think my dad used to uh, take me out to certain pubs on a Sunday afternoon when they were open maybe family weddings, but back then there used to be full band set-ups, say in the pubs on a Sunday afternoon. But I spoke mainly weddings, mainly weddings, family weddings. Now, God, they used to put me on the kit. I, I couldn't touch the, the, the pedals, you know, I'd be floating kind of thing. But still had this kind of, uh, I don't know, marching band approach to drums, if you like. Which is? Uh, just rolls, certain rolls, this, that. Not that I knew what I was doing, didn't yeah. have a bloody clue. But, you know, I used to be able to knock out a tune with the band, and, you know, for a little small kid. Mm -hmm. For me, it was amazing. For the family watching, it was probably uh, quite mesmerising as well. Cool. When did you first start thinking of getting a band together? Neighbours. Neighbours, well, a couple of lads in the next street. We set up. Uh, in one of his living room, in the living room of this particular friend's house. The noise must have been a trope and madness, pure madness. Everything turned up to ten. Drums on their own. What were... age were you then? Sorry? What age were you then? God, twelve. What was the band called? No idea. Even if we had a name, I haven't got a blood, I can't remember. No idea. Right, okay. But, you know, we were getting knocking out Beatles, bits of Beatles. It was pretty good quality for, you know, young musicians who didn't know what well, they were doing musically, if you like, yeah. yeah, yeah, all by ear, but... Who was the first member of Oasis that you met? Gwigs. 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 Yeah, Gwigs, I knew Gwigs. Gwigs literally lived, oh, I'm going to 500 yards away, I must say. Not far away, anyway, quarter of a mile. Yeah. Um, but I knew Gwigs, mm, eight, nine or ten, some, eight, eight or nine, yeah, yeah, local lad. Football, it was always football. Uh, you know, various teams, depending on your school, for example, mm. put a team together, meet a few Burnish lads, you know, a bit of a kick about. Um, but yeah, Gwigson would be the first one to meet. Through the football? Yeah. 
Very good football, aren't Griggs? And next? Next? Oh, but yeah, then, damn, I'm not even thinking as well. Uh, the, the two Gallagher's, Liam and Noel, there was a five-a-side pitch that we used to pretty much, you could stay on there with the floodlights till 10 o'clock at night. Now, even though they were Burnage lads, we were 11 Zoom, everybody and anybody would congregate on this five-a-side pitch to, you know, God almighty, there could be 40, 50 lads there. Uh, you know, first to score, we'll say, with your team of six or something like that, on and off, on and off. Next goal wins. <coughs> next, yeah, next yeah. goal wins, yeah, that's pretty much. But I knew, uh, you know, I've got a vivid memory of Noel with this, like, mohair cardigan right down to his knees. I remember him walking on. He was only, he's only a short lad, isn't he? Yeah. Not that I'm tall, massive, but I have a vivid, vivid memory of Noel walking on and thinking, what's he come dressed as like? <laughs> but uh, something that none of us kind of would have worn back then, if you like. I don't think. I didn't. Uh, and occasionally then Liam would be accompanying the uh, trap mill, following on behind him, but they, you know, I pretty much ev met everybody but Bonehead uh, by the time I'd left school. So when did you meet Bonehead? So Bonehead was the only one I'd not met, and I believe Bonehead and Gwigs um, decided to form a band with a local singer called Chris Hutton. At that time, they had a, a little drum machine with them as well, practising in a garage and stuff like that. But they decided to have the little first public outing, uh, to which I was invited down to see being the only local drummer they knew, would I want to join the band? And I've got to say, uh, I don't know how impressed I was at the time, but it was like, absolutely yes. It, you know, what were I, they called? Oh, was it? It might have been the rain. They might have been a Did they have that I name think, then? I think, I'm thinking. Um, eventually, you know, right, joined. Uh, we had a local hotel that, um, called Raffles. But um, the girls used to drink, the girls at the hotel who were running it, we used to meet at a club, um, Fallowfield, and just, you know, got along with these girls and they eventually said, look, you can have our basement in the hotel of Raffles. It, was, it landed perfectly for us. What, to rehearse in? To rehearse, yeah. Because, right. you know, cost money, you know, if you had to go to town to get a proper rehearsal studio, awkward getting there, costly. Uh, whereby, you know, this local, only a mile or two away from our houses, um, yeah, was it Bonehead had his pick up at the time? So it used to be Bonehead, there used to be three seats in the front, Bonehead driving, Chris and uh, Gwigs, and I had to jump on the back of the pickup right. to get us down to this uh, local hotel. But, you know, we pretty much rehearsed for hours and then we could come up and get drunk, we could do what we was. Just a great Because there was a bar upstairs. Bar right, upstairs. Got it, yeah. Same yeah. ideal, yeah. Everyone would go to bed and we'd be there serving ourselves. It was, oh, it's just, a, that's when the, the nuttiness started, I suppose. So, so that's the nucleus of Oasis beginning then? Yeah. 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 And then what happened? We, you know, with respect to Chris Sutton, the, the singer we had at the time, um, you know, I think that especially Griggs and Bowen had really wanted to move on. Uh, find somebody else. I mean, we'd do a gig and then, you know, we'd sort of rest on our laurels and people patting us on the back for months and go, oh, that was great. And, you know, you, you wouldn't do another gig or whatever, a get together for three or four months. You were never going to make it doing that. So it's like, right, we have to step it up, we need a new singer. Why, why, why did you say new singer? What was wrong with the old guy? He's, a, he's just, again, with respect to Chris, his stage presence, it just, something didn't quite gel. Yeah, yeah. Um, he wasn't a Liam Gallagher. He wasn't a Liam Gallagher, you know, yeah. <laughs> but then again... <laughs> Who is? Exactly. Who is? Who is? But um, Paul Ashby, a um, friend of Boners at the time, um, he was, used to develop the footballers' cars. And he used to bring Liam out to work with him pretty much every day as he was scratching as well. Um, Liam had aspirations of becoming a, a singer. Paul Ashby put two and two together and, you know, eventually uh, brought him down to rehearsals. It just clicked. We yeah. knew. We knew. It was, so, at least it was going in the right direction. They wrote a song, Take Me. Reminisce was another one. Three or four tracks. I mean, we only had one or two public outings as that set up. Um, but then I think there was times where Noel used to have long, long periods off of touring with the Inspiral Carpets. 
uh, Liam, Mither, 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 him to come down, come on, he got songs, da da da. But eventually, Sunday afternoons, uh, we were actually in proper rehearsal studios then, out Oldham Roadway somewhere out there, I can't remember the name. Uh, used to do proper rehearsals, but we'd be, we'd be coming down from Saturday night, whatever was going on on Saturday night, the vibe was, it was like, it was brilliant. Just, instant sort of connection. I once said, I once said that any of us were exceptional musicians then, even if now. Um, but there was a natural, a gel. Mm. You know, the, 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 we'd fill each other, musically we'd sort of fill each other's spaces and it was just the perfect come together, if you like. Mm. Uh, real hard, wall of sound kind of uh, rhythm section, tough. I credit Bonehead that. Right. I credit Bonehead there, but I was, if you like, in competition with that right. for sound. Um, but I reckon that's the, the nucleus of, of Oasis and that wall of sound that is still evident today. And were they still called Rain at that point? No. When Liam joined, not so long after, we, we were rebranded as Oasis. Right. So, so we were Oasis before Noel come. Right, so let's get it. The name was changed after Liam joined, but before Noel joined yes. to Oasis yeah. from the Rain. So he's not a member of Oasis, no. no. Sorry? <laughs> You so are. He's not a member of Oasis, no. <laughs> I, I had always presumed they'd, they'd been out live gigging as the rain with Liam in. One or two gigs, mate. Right, OK. So Liam joins the band, at which point you're still called the rain? Yeah, I'm going to get it out. Yeah. Not too long after that. And it was Liam's idea to change the name, I believe. Yes. And why was that? He didn't like the name. I don't think, you know, I think, you know, there's another band called The Rain from Liverpool. Was there? Again, a fresh start, new line-up, uh, new way forward, really. And so it's Liam's suggestion to change the name from The Rain to Oasis, mm -hmm. which you all obviously agreed upon. Yes. And then off you went. So you did some gigs as Oasis before Noel joined. Mm. And Good then luck. how did Noel come to join the band? My, lots of my either, from Liam especially. Um, you know, like uh, Liam was aware, aware that he had a lot of songs up his sleeve. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good or bad or whatever, but he, he, again, he had, besides the songs, we, we, in fact, he was manager. We, will you come as our manager? Right. Yeah. Because, because he had of his contacts. Yes, yeah. yes. And he was well connected to the industry, and we thought that's our way forward. Right. Um, but eventually he joined and become a member of Oasis. Him joining the band, that's, a, that's obviously a crucial point. You'd, you'd contacted him to initially with a view to being the manager. Hmm. How did that change into him actually joining the band then? So he, he came down to one of the gigs, I believe. Yeah, and he also came to, we were doing a demo, which I don't think it was only for us as a four piece. Right. But we invited him down and he did put little bits on. Right. And, and I've got a vivid memory of in the control, uh, control room or green room even. Me, Liam and Noel, and I'm pretty much saying join our band, join our band. The truth is he, he was going to join initially on bass. Was he? He was. That's, um, but, you know, we were, I wasn't having any of that. It's what do what you mean, getting rid of Gwigs? Mm. Really? Yeah. See, I've never heard this story before. Mm. So initially he was going to replace Gwigs and play the bass. Mm. Wow. But, and, but you was. were against that? Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's incredible. I didn't, I'd never heard that before. Yeah. But it was, you know, so it's a muted, quiet point that everyone's kind of rolled over. But uh, yeah, it, that's the way it was going to happen. But it, it was like we all clubbed together and no, that ain't happening. Oh, so yeah. you, and he eventually joined on guitar. Put something on Take Me, if I'm not mistaken. Done some kind of a twiddling over Take Me or one of the two tunes that we did it out of the blue. Oh, yeah. Now we negotiated studio space, Bonehead being a plasterer. So me and Bonehead, I were laboured on Bonehead to gain studio time to, as he plastered the studio. Oh, so, it, that, so that's how you paid for it? How we paid for it. Right. Yeah. You, pay, you paid for this, Oasis paid for this first recording session studio time by Bonehead plastering, plastering the studio. Yeah. Remarkable. Yeah. Bonehead with his uh, level with no bubble, by the way. Let's throw that in there. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Nothing was level. You ever had any work done by that man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so go on, yeah, so we've got Noel Gallagher has joined the band, not on bass as was initially intended, which I didn't know, that's an incredible story. And then what happened? 
We did, we, uh, again, Norwoodies contacts in spiral carpets, uh, a room become available in the basement of uh, the boardwalk. Right. It was pittance, when I look back, it was pittance to, to, to rent that room. But still, we couldn't afford it. it we really couldn't, you know, it was mounting up the debt. Uh, we got in that room, now that room, a little small room, five by five metres or something like that. You know, it, it was like being on a rocket ship in there or something, the sound, your ears were blown off when you come out of that room. Yeah. Like stepping off, a, like I say, a spaceship. But the vibe in that room was the energy. Is, is that where that footage um, yeah. all around the world is yes. shot? Yes. Who shot that? Oh, God, what's his name? Bobby Langley. Bobby Langley. Was it Bobby? Yeah, right. Blair. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think he followed us then to a gig at the venue, um, just up from the Hacienda at the time. Where, that was our, uh, what do you call it, a fringe event for. In the city? In the city. Right. We, we just managed to get on the end of that. Yeah, because I'd met Noel just before that. Right. Because he minded me to come along to it, and I, for one reason or other, I didn't. The first time I saw Oasis play was at the Hop and Grape Bar, supporting Dodger. University. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you've got this rehearsal space as a result of Noel's contacts, but you can't really afford to keep it. No. So what happened then? So believe you know, it was uh, well just on a on a note of not being able to afford it. You know, everyone would be watching the clock near ten o'clock. 10 o'clock so it's like whoever was last out that door had to go upstairs drop the key off give some bullshit uh, explanation as to why we couldn't afford rent again you know we were all we were possibly hundreds in debt at that point really uh but i used to be watching it i had the kit in front of me do you know what i mean and you used to be watching people clocking eyes and then gone and i busted i was a last out again yeah so tail between my legs up to go explain why Liam hasn't had his doll this week and I don't get paid till next week and any ex bullshit excuse we could come up with. But fair play to the boardwalk, the, you know, we have, I think eventually that bill did get paid. Did it? Once we got a, a deal. Oh, creation paid it in the I, end. Or the advance might be yeah. something, I don't remember it being unsettled. Right. Uh, but, you know, I've got to say, a big cheers to the boardwalk for supporting us in that period that we needed it. You know, Noel's in the band, you've got this rehearsal space, you've got this incredible vibe going on. What were the gigs like at that point? The gigs, this, the, we still had that energy as a band, without a doubt, but maybe, you know, a lot of them were, a lot of the tunes, they were kind of jammy, if you like, with words put over it somewhat in places. Uh, the, you know, the actual, the, the great songs were yet to come. Right, so the, so the structured songs weren't there as such, it was just you lot effectively rehearsing in, in, the, in the public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So wow. jamming away, uh, but still again, that, that sound was evident there, do you know, yeah. without a doubt, that was, I, I, you know, I was, me, Quiggs and Liam, quite this, of similar age, but if you consider that Bone and Noel were a bit more mature, a bit more wise to music, if you like, a bit more educated, Right. Um, I, th I think that, you know, was the perfect gel, really, for us all, yeah. All culminated in the Glasgow King Tut's gig, which, of course, Alan McGee noticed you at. Did. Um, how did that gig come... I mean, again, there's lots of myths about, you know, bowling up there, threatening the, the promoter. I'm sure that's not quite what happened. What, how do you remember? They weren't, uh, they weren't letting us play. We pretty much were... Uh, you know, we've, we'd, it cost us a fortune. To us, that was a fortune yeah. to hire a van, you know, to make your way all the way up to Glasgow. That was a, a, a big thing out of our lives then. It was yeah. financially. Yeah, yeah. And we were like, you know, bloody hell, mate, we've come all this way. So they weren't going to let you play? No, that's my memory is they weren't going to let us play. But after, which I won't call everyone, they weren't shouting them down, but a gentle persuasion, I think yeah. uh, we got Just like, come on, mate, we've come all the way yeah, from Manchester. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was no big threat. So they, they were pretty reasonable about it then? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you, you know, if you, I think some of the stories, it's almost like you're threatening to kill people, so that obviously didn't happen. Nah, no, 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 I don't, not quite. Just, just for clarity, how did you get onto the bill in the first place? Through, we were sharing a room with um, a band called Sister Lovers. Sister Lovers. Uh, some acquaintances of Liam's two girls in the bands yeah. in the band um, they one of them I believe was in contact stroke seeing Alan McGee 
Right. So we jumped on board um, all the way up to Glasgow and uh, slight altercation getting in, but eventually they appreciated the effort we'd come to and uh, let's play for three songs, was it? Three songs? I think it was three songs, something very, you can have 15 minutes or something. Right. Yeah. Luckily, as fate goes, Alan was sat there. Right. Do you remember any of the meeting with him afterwards? Do you... The only thing I really remember was no sort of approach. I don't think we were aware that he was sat there. I really don't think any of us would have recognised him. I certainly didn't. Yeah, because he wasn't that famous then, no. was he? I mean, no. you know, he, he ran a cool label. Yeah, but he... and cool bands, yeah. Uh, but but he's su- not the mogul that he became, was he, at that no. point? Yeah. No, he sort of into this Tony Wilson kind of yeah. figure, didn't he? Um, I believe he missed his train home. Uh, he did approach Noel after. Mentioned if you got a deal, da 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 and all that. To which, you know, we haven't got a deal. I think Noel will try and playing it cool. So uh, as a, he was telling me, I remember Noel telling me, yeah, this guy, there's a guy over there going to sign us. And he, he, he said, he's coming over, he's coming over. And, he, and he's like, at cool. I'm going, at cool, what the fuck? You know, mm-hmm. but how do you at cool? What do you, mm-hmm. what's he on about? But uh, yeah, we all acted cool, and uh, fair play to Alan. He he, he, he gives us that deal and gives us a chance. Yeah, because I saw you for the first time live after that, but before you'd had a record out that say the Hop and Great by you had been signed at that point, and that was the first night I think Marcus came to see you. Yeah, with Johnny Marr, mm. and. Uh, because Noel had been mithering me for ages to come and see the band, and I hadn't because I thought they are bound to be rubbish because all your mates' bands are rubbish. Yeah. And I missed the beginning of the set, but I remember stood there, and it, it's not a big room, obviously. It's the Hop and Grape Bar at Manchester U. 300 capacity. And there was about six people there, including yeah. me, Marcus and Johnny Marr. And it was just like a juggernaut had come through the wall. I couldn't believe it. It was just astonishing. And um, I remember afterwards, Bonehead was the merchandise guy. I've still got the T-shirt, actually. That, the very rare original one. He was uh, driver then as well. Was he? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, I think that's the best time in any band's history, when they're first starting out, they've been signed, but it's not all gone, you know, nobody's gone mental yet or anything. And Yeah, just a remarkable, remarkable time to be around that band. It was so exciting. When you say juggernaut, yeah. the, the, the sound of... Yeah. The sound of... The, yeah, see, we always used to say... My God, I'd love to sit out, sit out there yeah. and go, what yeah. the hell is You never going? saw Oasis play? I did. Well, sorry. We'll get there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was at their last get-together 2009 at the festival. But I wanted to experience what it was like being an Oasis crowd. So was that the first time you saw Oasis play? The yes, last gig? ever since, yes. Sorry? Ever since I left the band, that was the first time I seen him. That's uncanny. Yeah. That, 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 that. Isn't that weird? <laughs> That's nuts. The first time you saw Oasis play was the last time they ever played. Yeah. That is bonkers, that. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that. A few nails in the coffin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, you know, it was pure madness how they kept up with it all. I don't know. But... I, I'm just going to say that again. The first time you saw Oasis play was the last time they ever played together. Mm. Wow. In an Oasis crowd, my God, I had to get out of there. I was probably... 10 yards from the stage. Right. It was pure madness. Yeah. And I was like, eventually I was like, no, nah, I've got to get to the back here, man. This, I'm too old for this. Like. Wow. So what was it like that night going back from Glasgow when you'd been signed? What was the vibe like in the van? Do you know what? Factory had offered us before, okay? Had they? Yeah. Oh, no, uh, they came down to see us. Right. So, you know, when you think you're getting close to yeah. a deal, wow, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it doesn't. You know, you you are right. a touch apprehensive. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah you, until the ink until is dry on that, the contract. Yes, you, right, absolutely. Fair yeah. yeah, yeah, I understand that. Um, but yes, then in the following weeks, months, Noel, Bonehead, Liam, whoever was available, really, uh, as work goes, they, they, they were up and down from London having meets with uh, Alan McGee, Creation. So I suppose the first thing that happened once you'd been signed of any great note was was going to record, and that happened pretty quickly, didn't it? Well, that was 93, wasn't it? Because... We were pretty much ready to record, I yeah. reckon. We were a solid tight band. We, yeah. yeah, I mean, anybody who hasn't seen it, they should watch the... It's on YouTube, Oasis Live at the Glen Eagles Hotel, because that's obviously before a record was out, and you are mustered in that. I don't mean, you, well, you obviously, but the band as a unit. 
before Oasis have ever released a record. That is an incredible show. So Oasis live at the Glen Eagles Hotel. Look it up, people. Yeah, good gig, great gig. I think that was straight after recording. Was it? I think it was whether the, you know, uh, we, we came pretty much straight from the studio to do that gig for Sony. So it was Mono Valley you went to to record the album first. So what's your, your memories of the, the Mono Valley recordings? This was the first time that I was ever out of eye contact with the band members, for us all, even. Right. I'd, I'd, I'd extend it to that. But, uh, you know, you're aware of the, it's almost like steeple-like in yeah. the, behind them doors, them big, massive doors. Uh, so they took me behind the doors and separated us all. Uh, I had a behind the doors, if I'm not mistaken, uh, just for sound, cut us all off from each other. But there was no eye contact. No, it wasn't comfortable for me, at least. Um, you, you're surrounded by 20, 30 mics. You know, you hit one of them mics and you start again. It was so ner for me. It was nerve wracking. Mm. Um, you know, and I remember Noel before we went in, you, you'll never be able to record, you won't, uh, whatever he was saying. I think it was nerve wracking for us all. It was the first, yeah, course, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think we soon, you know, whether that affected tempo and uh, certainty with each other, the eye, lack of eye contact, I don't know. But it, it, that session eventually didn't feel right. It, you know, it, that, whatever, Dave Scott and what was the other guy, Kinks. Um, Dave Bachelor. Dave Bachelor. Mm. Yeah, it, that dirty sound, if you like, yeah. was not coming through their monitors. Right. Us, real us. It just it was too clean cut. It didn't sound right. So with respect to Dave, it was quickly recognised, um, and you know, Dave was gone the next morning. There was no. Was it? Yeah, That's how long did that take? I think it was a couple of days. Set up. Is that start it? Start recording. I think we got slide away. Yeah. Um, but literally a couple of days, and then we realised this isn't going well. This, is, this isn't us. Yeah. You could hear it, it was too clean. It was whether it was the way he was doing it, or. But I think eventually, then they decided, you know, we've got to get these in a room together. That's the way it all. So when we came down to do the sleeve for Supersonic, which is obviously shot in Mono Valley, where were you at then at the recording process? Well, that must have been at the very beginning then, wasn't it? Pretty much, because I was thinking about the sleeve, we were all in place. I You're think. still there, obviously. Yeah, the mics. Because was... once they got rid of Dave Batchelor, you left the studio, presumably. You didn't carry on recording there, did you? I think we tr it was tailing off. I think we had, had, had canned, if you like, everything we were going to do, but it wasn't right. Right. And I think, uh, like I said, it was quickly recognised. Alan McGee, Mark Coyle, yeah. being our live engineer, he's like, e nah, something not right. I'll tell you what was amazing though, those pictures that you took while you were there that I saw for the first time oh. this week. I mean, what, what must it have been like? Because you you, you, I just can't begin to get me around it that, you know, one minute you're not signed, the next, because it all happened so quickly, the next minute you were, then you're in this, because it is an incredible studio, isn't it? Yes. And it's just all you like, you must have been thinking, Bloody hell, what's going on here? And I think that comes across in the pictures. Everybody looks a bit nervous, but at the same time a bit giddy. Enthusiastic, yeah. 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 Uh, it was a great shot you took of Liam playing Noel's guitar. Or you, might, you think it might have been Johnny Marr's guitar, that, didn't you? Possibility. I mean, there I was with a little Kodak camera. Yeah, it was yeah, all going to be yeah. memories for me. It was just however long it was going to last it. Yeah, amazing historical documents there, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so it was realised pretty quickly that wasn't happening. So you scrapped that uh, and then set off to Cornwall. What do you remember about that session at Saw Mills? Cause I've been to Saw Mills was where Verve recorded their first album as well. All oh, right. So we were down there before yeah. you. All right, God. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I think part of the plan was to keep us out of the pub as well. Right. So I think it was, you get in there by, but do you remember going in by yeah, yeah, via yeah, the yeah. boat? I, I drove all the equipment down there. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. D ducking to get under the bridge while, while the tide is yeah. in, yeah, if yeah. you like. And then once that tide is out, you're screwed. You've yeah. got a two mile walk, is it? A mile or two walk Down along a railway, railway track. track. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> along a railway track to go yeah. Yeah. to the pub. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose you could only get that freedom once you'd um, done your, uh, your bits and bobs. But if I remember rightly, again, we, we got in this room, uh, back to eye contact, yeah. nods, winks, da 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 da, comfort. And that, that was quite a fast recording session, if I uh, yeah. remember rightly. Mark, was behind the um, 
the desk with Anjali Dutt. Mm. And it, it, it just encapsulated the band perfectly. Mm. Uh, ready then to pass on to uh, Owen eventually. Well, that, yeah, because that's the point, isn't it? That wasn't known at that point. They passed it on to Owen because Coyley couldn't get it. That, that was the vibe, wasn't it? They just, the recording, I think the recordings are okay, but more well, of it. Well, yeah, Owen didn't actually record. There's a good point, actually. Owen didn't record any of Definitely, or apart from some overdubs here and there, I guess. But yeah. on the whole, he didn't record it. No. Coyley did with Anjali, but they couldn't get the mix right, could they? And that's why Owen was brought in. Yeah, yeah. I believe, well, obviously, with respect to Mark Coyle, um, uh, Owen was well-established. Yeah. Techniques. Well, I think Coyle had just been doing live sound, hadn't he? Yeah. The studio yeah. recordings are entirely different, and mixing is an entirely yes. different species, Absolutely. isn't it? Yeah. So, you know. So I think I, I, initially he was trying to encapsulate that, the, the sound of the band coming out of the monitors. Rock. Yeah. You know, bang you in the face kind of a vibe. Yeah, yeah. So he got that right and, yeah, evident in the record, I suppose. So definitely maybe he's recorded, the single's recorded, and then you're off then. Mad, mad, yeah. What, what do you remember? If, if, from, you know, it, it was like overnight, you know, once that first single was out and we were exposed to the public, you know, we've gone from playing a couple of people in the gig to people, hundreds locked out. Yeah. It was, it just absolutely snowballed. It just went nuts. Yeah. Uh, you know, we co-headlined with a, a whiteout, a band yeah, called yeah. Whiteout at the I time. Remember, I was on that tour, yeah. 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 Um, you know, and it came became quite evident with respect to the lads that the you know the crowd had come to see us. Yeah, yeah. So they it was them who suggested that you're going to headline. Yeah, because as I remember it, it was all turn at night. You'd, it was a co-headlining tour, yes. and Oasis would headline one night, and then Whiteout would headline the next night. But after a few dates, like you say, everybody's, everybody's going to watch Oasis. So they they said, "Fair enough, you go on last." Good lads. Yeah. yeah, fair play to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah give us that. Uh, it just exploded. It just ex the gigs got bigger, bigger, bigger. The everything just got bigger. And very quickly as well, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, recognition on the streets, and you're like, you know, yeah. it's all new. Everything was new and quite... foreign trips. Yeah, God, yeah. Which we only lived on bloody McDonald's wherever we went. Did that you? was the them golden towers. We can get something to eat there. What was Japan like? Absolutely nutty, nutty, brilliant place. That's let's go there. Okay. Uh, respectful. The fans were, wow, it was Beatlemania. I, I, that yeah. was the closest to Beatlemania I, I personally have experienced. Mm. There was, um, you know, we were in this uh, high rise hotel. Oh my God, I got 20, 30 floors, I don't know, whatever. But, you know, we'd be in the hotel. You'd, if you come to the wrong floor, there'd be screaming girls there. Mm. Ah, close the doors, close the doors. Yeah. Uh, there'd be 300 people outside. It, it, that was, it was pure madness. I remember back there, you used to room with Bonehead, didn't you? I did. Yeah, because I remember Best that. Best room, that. Yeah, yeah. I remember Embassy Hotel, Bayswater Road, bringing Richard Ashcroft up, winding him up, pretending yes. to be a Jamaican yardie. Yeah. Like, those were the days, man. It was astonishing. Chucks away, Ashcroft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bugging Alan McGee late at night. Also, oh, so, oh, at of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your favourite gig? It's got to be Glastonbury for me, I think. Yeah, yeah it's uh, obviously a historical place who hasn't played there yeah. you know but I, I, again probably definitely the biggest crowd i ever played for was it yeah august 94 was it something like that june 94 whatever june. it was usually in june in it yeah it's, it's always it's like summer solstice isn't it so, um, yeah so 21st week of june weekend around there i mean i think we were on it somewhat like two or three in the afternoon yeah, yeah. and for the crowd we drew yeah you know, that was unprecedented, really. There's yeah, yeah. 30, 40,000 people there. Incredible. I remember not looking at it before I went on. Really? Yeah. I just don't, don't even, you know, get out there, do your shit. And, and plus it was filmed. I don't know if that was one of the yeah. first times, maybe, that as a live filming goes, you know. It was all a bit, for me, daunting, but we got through it. What was the last gig you played? I think it was Paris. Oh, no, we, we fell out in Paris, I think. Right. Came to do Sheffield, yeah. Right. So I think she that's the order. Sheffield Arena. Yeah. Again, like you, very evident where the band is going in a very short period. It was yeah. like, oh. Because that was 95, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember Marcus, Mark, you know, I think, was, was there a Christmas gig in Sheffield? And um, Marcus rolled us out to the Sheffield Arena and said, you're playing here by us. Yeah. And it was just like, you jaw it, the floor mm. like, and 
you know, that, I, I think that was one of the first nights uh, brought my mum along and all the mothers were in a box and it was great, it was brilliant. So th that was obviously about the time that you were well, thrown out of the band, there's no other way Not of putting it really. Not too long after, yeah. Did you, did you see it coming? No, there was like, you know, there was always arguments with, if it wasn't me one day, it'd be somebody else and, you know, but you kind of rely on the, you know, the statements that you'd hear, if anyone goes, it's over, do you know what I mean? It will never be the same. And I really do believe that it, it hasn't been the same in certain respects. No. Um, you know, Alan White, fantastic, brilliant drummer, but... Um, did they need to change? I don't think so. I, I really do believe that um, I would have been able to record a, you know, something comparable at least. Really? Probably a bit tougher. Yeah. As Finesse would, you know, did no want that. I don't really know. I, I... So you didn't see it coming then? No. I mean, there was always tension in that band. You know, they look back and go, yeah, yeah, he was going anyway. Mm. Anybody, I think, could have been, it could have been your last day, the next day, or the band could have quit. The band could have been off the road. Yeah. The arguments are seen and, you know, first hand, you're like, man, we're not here tomorrow. There was a few times on the road, no, in America when he got off. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was like, yeah. it's over. I really believed it was over. Yeah. So how did you find out? Marcus, Marcus gave us a phone call. He said, are you sat down, Will? I said, I am, yeah. He goes, uh, the, band, uh, the band are not too happy and want to move on to another drummer. He said the band then, not yeah, no, the yeah. band. Yes. Yeah, right. but uh, uh, you know, uh, again, you look back and uh, you hear little things these days that um, I don't believe, I'm not really sure if they were, especially Liam maybe, he's not involved in sacking people, so no, I don't believe so, but didn't so, see it coming. So Marcus rang you, uh, and then what happened next? Uh, well, fucking hell, I, I was gobsmacked, I, absolutely, what, really, it's over. Oh, by the way, that was the first number one single that week as well. Yeah. Oh, is that week? With some of course, say. You, you played the... F we did pre-release on Top of the Pops. Right. Uh, Wednesday or th Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever of course, it was. Of course, yes. So we did the week before, knowing that it was going to go to number one. Right. So, was, you know... And of uh, course, then they did it again with Alan White drumming, didn't they? Yes. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did watch that, actually. So you didn't watch that? I did. You did? I did. I was like, what? Yeah, just to... Oh, I couldn't have watched it. I would have done my head in that. No. I mean, how you got through it, I'll never know. I mean, it's not just like being kicked out of any band. It was that band, and that band just exploded. For, I mean, you couldn't have got away from it. Everywhere you looked, you know, literally everywhere you looked, Oasis was in your face. I mean, how did you deal with it? Every bloody radio station in Everything, the car. Exactly, like, every paper, every, up, yeah. everywhere. How did you deal with it? I don't really know. I think I got drunk for three years. I do know Did that. You? Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, I don't blame you. Mate. It wasn't so long after that the uh, the first royalty come in. Um, you know, I was to be honest that I was like, you know, uh, up the creek without a paddle. I thought I had no money going. What I've done all that for? What? What? Yeah. What's going on? Where's, you know, where's it? Where's the money? Have we sold? What? What are we in? Plus, we'll call it. You know, do we own the record company? I didn't know where we stood. Nobody. Give me any information. I think it was that September then, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around there we I got my first royalty check, which kind of eased things up a bit. But yeah. Why had, they, had he been having a go at you prior to that? He, he, everybody, I think. Yeah, I mean the way I look at things now, started with me, and it ended with Thal Liam. Like it's you know he's gone through everybody really. I don't think you know I'd love to say we're all still talking and. But it's just the weirdest situation to be in. We create something so special, like, and brilliant. Um, and uh, then it ends like that. It's, I, I didn't like that end of it like much. And of course, then after that, there was the court case. Yeah. So what can you tell us about that? Uh, well, me looking at it reasonably, um, I look back and the two, their solicitor, my solicitor, got together uh, thrashed it out um, and came to an agreement. This is two law-abiding practicing solicitors. Um, came to an agreement, which we all thought was fair. I'd entered the next period of the contract somewhat. So there has to be, should have been negotiation out of that. Um, so they brought it down to what it could be. They looked at it as a maximum, then looked at it as a minimum. 
and added a bit onto that, we'll say. Came to an agreement, he went back to the band and totally, completely flat uh, denied it, uh, not to let it go ahead. Um, and then in my head, I was like, well, it, they've got to be right. And that's the way my thinking was like, well, it's got to, you know, that these solicitors have got to be right. I, I'm going, I'm going to try and go further with this. I do regret it. Do no. You? Yeah. I do, looking back, I do regret it. But I didn't know what else to do at the time. I just didn't know. Right. What, what do you mean you regret? What do you regret? That it went that way. Right. I, mean, I don't think we needed to. I don't think, it, you know, if... if uh, I think everyone was off the tits at the time, arrogant, ignorant, protective of the whole thing. It's just like, well, look, our mums fucking made biscuits together at right. Matt Vitties. Our mums know each other, just little things in my head. Surely we can work out. Didn't, didn't want it. Yeah. Um, so then it just got a bit messy, really. Yeah. But then along the way, you find out different things. You know, um, I can't go too deep into certain things, but um, I realised it wasn't the band. You know, no, uh, there was a bigger case to be had with the solicitor because he denied his involvement in the making of the contract, but then approved it. Right. And that's when, uh, well, it went to court. The judge then said, if I let this go through, the floodgates are all going to open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our law needs to change. France, Canada, there was a few territories around the world that had accommodated the things like this. So looking back on it all, how do you feel about it all now? Proud and happy that I was involved in something yeah. so massive that had made such a difference to people's lives, you know, what are we now, 30, we're nearly 30 years later here, yeah. still talking about it. It's, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that for me, that's amazing. And, and it's still touching people's lives. Liam is out there, you know, still representing Oasis in, in a massive capacity. Yeah. Uh, and the kids love it. Mm. You got a message for the fans at all? Just want to say thank you for your support over the years. And I'm really glad and lucky to, to be in such a, such a position to be, uh, still somewhat representing it. Nice one, Tony. Thank you very much, Tony McCarroll. Good man, Bright. Thank you very much. Is that all right?